in talking about forgiveness, I think it's really important to start with anger um, because it's, uh, you know, what forgiveness is really about, right? It's like being free of that anger, letting go of that anger. One of my favorite depictions of anger, there's so many definitions out there, but to me, my favorite thing when I'm thinking about, really thinking about what is anger is from the movie Inside Out. And if you haven't seen this movie, it's a really wonderful movie uh, about uh, a young girl who's struggling uh, with this five primary emotions uh, that humans have. And you will be unsurprised if you're familiar with Paul Ekman's work, uh, that he was actually the consultant on that movie and helped them create uh, those those emotions, uh, those five emotion characters in the movie Inside Out. It's a children's um, movie, but it is, it is, it's for grownups, definitely. So uh, if you've seen it, you will know that anger is actually quite a beloved and an adorable character. Uh, and you know, for those of us who have been taught that anger is never okay and that it's, you know, that many of us from our religious histories have been um, told that anger is not okay and that's a thing to completely eradicate from ourselves and, um, you know, that, that this view of anger actually really gives a balanced view. This character gives a balanced view. And um, what's really lovely about him is that you see him uh, described as a character who cares deeply about injustice. He cares a lot about when things are unfair. Uh, and that's a really valuable piece of anger, right? Um, but at the same time, um, in the movie, hit the top of his head often blows off. And that is not his finest moment or his most useful moment. Um, and so uh, this question that was in um, the um the meditation tonight. Do you feel you have been angry long enough? It came up a bit in the chat as well. Um, that question comes directly from a question that His Holiness asked me. Uh, when I met with him, I was 24 years old, and I was really in the depths of a lot of physical and mental trauma and suffering, unresolved uh, things about the sexual harm that I had endured as a child. Uh, and some other pretty terrible things that had happened to me along the way already by the age of 24. And I was primarily carrying a lot of rage towards my father, who had sexually abused me, but who had passed away when I was 16. And so the notion uh, that forgive, uh, that uh, that justice would ever arise was just never going to happen, right? That was that was that was never going to be my my personal relationship with the person who had caused me harm. And so, but I was still carrying all this rage um, and it was destroying me and my life. And when his holiness asked me this, I was begging him for a formula about how to forgive. I noticed that the Dalai Lama was actually quite skilled at moving forward towards uh, the well-being of his people. Uh, he was really uh, skilled at uh, thinking about how to end oppression, how to work towards collective liberation. But he wasn't motivated by the same kind of rage that was um, motivating me. And so um, so I was begging him for a formula and his holiness wouldn't give me a formula. <laughs> he just he kept uh, gently encouraging me to engage in a thought benefit, a, a cost benefit analysis of rage on my own life. And I was um, unable to do so. I was so in a state of rage that I kind of just wanted him to give me sort of like the forgiveness pill. And so when I kept prodding him and I kept prodding him. Uh, and he ultimately paused and he thoughtfully sort of took in my mental state. And he asked me this profound question um, that I received as having zero judgment behind whatever answer might come out of my mouth. He asked me, do you feel you have been angry long enough? Do you feel you've been angry long enough? In that moment, our conversation came to a complete standstill. I was sort of stunned by the openness of it, by the freedom to offer any answer, um, and it was not, um, there was some time, like many, many moments past, maybe minutes, uh, where I just sat in sort of this stark, unconditional expanse of his presence and his question. And I did, at that point, engage in the thing that he had been asking me to do for the past 20 minutes of our conversation, which was this cost-benefit analysis. How was my anger serving me? How had my anger served me? And how was it? disserving me. And so 
ultimately by going through this analysis, I realized that my anger mostly has diminishing returns at this point on my life, my body, my relationships, my family. Um, but that realization didn't sort of magically free me uh, from my anger at my father. Um, in fact, I walked out of that meeting with the Dalai Lama still carrying all my anger. But it, he also, he gave me more than that, right? He had given me steps. Uh, he gave me two pieces of advice, which I mentioned earlier uh, during the meditation. Um, these two pieces. One was to uh, consider um, meditation as a method of being able to reign in my mind. He said that my mind had gone completely out of my own control every time I was in a state of rage and that meditation might be beneficial to help guide me back uh, to having some level of control over my own mind. And um, yeah, and so I took uh, that first piece of advice. I was like, yes, absolutely. I can see that. I would like to learn how to meditate. That I can do. And then the second part of advice that he gave me was uh, to consider opening my heart uh, to those who um, who I can currently consider my enemies uh, without excusing their behavior, he said, consider their humanity, their position and their needs. And at that point, I kind of, I laughed out loud at him. I said, I'm not, I'm not opening, I'm not aligning myself. He said, maybe align yourself with their well-being. Or, and I said, I'm not aligning myself with anything. And so he leaned over and he patted my knee and he said, okay, okay, you just meditate then, you just meditate. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I at least started with that first part, which was meditation. And and through my meditation practice, I was able to let go of my anger. Uh, it doesn't come at the same time in the same way for every person. But I do really, I think the starting place really, uh, and I'd seen in the chat earlier, like, well, what if I haven't been angry long enough? And I think that the first piece that is so important, what helped more than anything was sitting in the presence of someone who was able to hold the totality of my story and let me go through that cost benefit analysis. So, um, and to, to really look at how has anger served me and how does anger disserve me? And to do so in the presence of someone who's able to really sit and listen. And so that I think is a really important part of the process. So maybe we can do a little bit of that now, which is just to sit with some of the answers to these questions, right? How does anger serve us? And so from a Western emotions frame, you know, anger triggers the fight response. Um, today, after many, many years of meditation practice, I can actually feel in my body when my anger is rising, I could actually feel the blood going to my biceps, getting ready to throw a punch. I don't throw a punch anymore, but that is what the body is helping me uh, do. You know, in the same way that I notice when I'm feeling fear that the blood is rushing to my legs, getting me ready to flee, right? And so these are normal and healthy responses to situations that are unsafe for us. Uh, but what I also notice, right, that if I I don't attend to my anger, uh, that, that that blood sort of literally begins to rise, right? My throat turns red, my face turns red, uh, and that's often followed with an explosion. Not anymore so much, but back in the day, an explosion of words. And they were sometimes in my 20s, scattershot and cutting and uh, not always wise. Um, but also, uh, there was a wisdom to my ability to whirl around and say with a lot of force the word stop when someone um, to the person who was, say, attached to the groping hands on the subway, right? But that is a protective life force. Uh, and it made boundaries clear when necessary. Uh, but, you know, there were times when it just continued beyond what was necessary. And that is the moment that um, is the wake up for me. Um, it also, you know, we talk about in, in terms of Western psychology, that anger motivates us to overcome obstacles when our goals are being thwarted or, or it's time to repair an injustice. Um, so, you know, when I wrote that letter to His Holiness, it really was about like anger is fueling this work, my work to end intimate partner and sexual violence. Uh, and I also was thinking when I wrote that note, like anger is the thing that caused me to launch out of my seat into a microphone, uh, you know, at community meetings. It propelled me to say necessary things. It also would say the 
you know, light of my rage illuminated uh, how disrespectful an ex-boyfriend had been to me. Uh, it helped me stop participating uh, in relationships that were demeaning to me. So, um, you know, these are some things that really were valuable. Um, it, it's still to this day, my anger is something that arises when it's time for me to sign an important petition or take to the streets uh, in protest of things that need to be protested. Um, or maybe even to stay up late and, and work on a legal strategy with a friend uh, who's trying to protect someone uh, that needs that needs my help. So, you know, I would ask you all now to take a few moments to just sit with what have been the benefits of the anger um, that you've carried, uh, you know, I, and, and to do so without judgment. The Dalai Lama has this little book called Be Angry. And I find it really <laughs> wonderful uh, to know this, that there is a book titled Be Angry, written by the Dalai Lama. Uh, and he says things like anger towards a social injustice will remain until the goal is achieved. It has to remain, um, you know, and that, you know, until that social justice, uh, that, that injustice has resolved. Uh, it's necessary in order to stop social injustice and wrong social, uh, wrong destructive actions. And so um, just take a moment now and see where it is in your own life that anger has served some positive purposes. How has your anger served you? Catalyst to take action, allowed me to stand up to bullies. All kinds of beautiful things are being sitting here. Yeah, it's clued me in. Don't ever express that certain things are not right. It's made me more independent and self-reliant. Yeah, I'm also seeing some things that are about the next part of what we'll be uh, looking at together, which is how it's not working. Um, there are ways in which anger isn't working. Um, anytime unfairness occurs, I stand up for the underdog. Here, here, <laughs> I identify with that. Um, so, you know, anger, how it arises and expresses itself it can actually be a really good thing. Um, but there might come a time Often in my life, I notice there comes a time when continuing to feel, harbor, and express anger no longer serves a positive purpose, or when those costs uh, begin to outweigh the benefits. And so um, to understand that tipping point, it was really helpful for me to spend some time analyzing anger's downsides. So for me, the costs of anger <laughs> were really clear by the time I met His Holiness, right? Uh, there were problems with my health, my relationships, my effectiveness at work. I had um, unbearable near daily migraines at one point, uh, blindingly so. Um, there was an assumption I had Crohn's disease. I had such incredible gastrointestinal pain. I was covered in eczema. Like so many, so many things um, were not great about my life, uh, let alone my relationships and the way in which all that anger was sort of leaking out all over everything. Um, so, and I noticed my ineffectiveness in my work, you know, just let alone the health complications were preventing me from showing up sometimes. Uh, but more than that, really just um, to think strategically, to be able to use that delicious prefrontal cortex in a way that could help me come up with the strategies and the, and the things that would be most beneficial uh, really were not at my disposal uh, when I was living in a constant state of rage. So, um, there's all kinds of research to show that prolonged anger um, on the health front can cause coronary heart disease, lung function problems, eczema, 
hypertension, uh, and other things co-arise like anxiety and insomnia. We all know that rage can steal our sleep. Uh, and there's so many other health complications that then are attendant to a lack of sleep. So, you know, I've definitely experienced all these things, anger stealing my sleep, leaving my stomachs in, in knots, um, even things like causing me when I'm preoccupied with anger to drive faster, right? I mean, we see road rage as a whole next level of putting yourself and others at risk. Um, but as we think about all these negative consequences of anger in our lives, it's really important to temper these findings with our understanding that, as discussed above, uh, a single instance of anger could, you know, save our lives or prevent harm from others. Um, but in the long run, it's that um, the grind that it has on our bodies and our lives that's really important to consider uh, whether it's time um, to put it down, right? So. When I particularly think about the impact of anger on my relationships, I'm often quite surprised that I have any of my dear and beloved friends from that time in my life. Um, and I'm really grateful that they practice what Buddhism would call the antidote to anger, which is patience. Um, and so uh, to that end, I'm, I'm quite grateful uh, that people stuck around through my angrier years. Um, you know, one of the things that I was most concerned about you know, other than with regard to the work that I have tried to do in the world um, around making sure that nobody has a childhood that involves any of the harms uh, that I experienced and, and other ex uh, harms that children experience in the world. Um, you know, I notice when I'm really, really angry about a policy or a decision someone's made that my best thinking really doesn't come when I'm in that limbic hijack uh, that that anger really does to me. Um, but at the same time, when I could recognize that, I was worried uh, back in my 20s that my whole identity was really tied up with being this like fierce advocate and that I wouldn't be me anymore if I freed myself from that anger. Uh, I also was really worried about being perceived as a sellout or an apologist if I didn't like live in a constant state of rage, not sufficiently feminist if I wasn't in rage about the patriarchy or misogyny and that I wouldn't be a sufficient ally if I wasn't in a perpetual state of rage about anti-blackness or the caste system, or mass criminalization. Like I, I felt that that was tied up in it, but it was really um, spending more time observing his holiness, the Dalai Lama, people like the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, so many other people who have been deeply, deeply effective at upending oppression and the liberation of their own people and others uh, that showed me that these, that, that really rage wasn't uh, the cleanest fuel that I might be burning, and that the Dalai Lama and others uh, like him are really burning some clean fuel. So um, so with all of this, um, I'd ask you to ask yourself, uh, how has anger disserved you in your life? Um, and you can put that in the chat or not, you know, if it's personal, you can keep it to yourself, but just take a moment to contemplate, you know, how does anger disserve you? How has anger not met your needs? Guarded stance is such a powerful one. Being irritable with others causes us sometimes to lash out incoherently, closes me off from love, confuses us. That's right. Makes me not see the humanity in the other person. Keeps me stuck and prevents growth. So, um, yeah, perpetuating rumination. There's so many more. I wish I had all the time in the world to read these all out. Maybe folks can take a peek in the um, pushes others away, drowns out joy. It limits what I see and feel. You could stay here all day in the chat with all of your brilliance drains my desire to continue. Absolutely. 
all of that. So I would ask us to take a moment to hold two truths simultaneously. And this kind of relates in some ways to um, one of the questions that had come up earlier um, that um, I can't remember exactly how it was asked. I can't read my chicken scratch notes here about the questions that are way back in the chat. Um, but, you know, there's a real value to learning how to uh, be able to hold two things at the same time, that this kind of complexity is lost to us, particularly when we're angry, but particularly in these very angry and rageful times. There's, it's a very black and white world. And I'm not trying to say that every injustice has a gray area, like some things just need to stop, right? I totally acknowledge that. And it, but I'm asking us to sit with two truths about our anger, right? It can do this and this. And learning to sit there in the middle uh, of those two things can really help us start to see a way forward or how to develop the relationship that we want to have in relationship to, to our anger. So one of my favorite things uh, in the world is this thing on Instagram called Vent, V-E-N-T, Vent Diagrams. So uh, if you're an Instagram person, you might check it out. Um, but basically the idea behind it is that we draw a uh, a Venn diagram, a regular old Venn diagram with two circles, and we write two truths, things that are both absolutely true, uh, but are in a bit of opposition to one another on the two sides of this diagram. So my anger helps me heal, my anger makes me sick, <laughs> are two truths about anger. And the truth of my relationship with anger sits in the middle of that Venn diagram, right? And so you might spend some time playing with that, uh, with with that visual, uh, about many of the things. Um, and on my own forgiveness journey, uh, some of the most complex and intractable problems start to find their way to um, a more holistic and useful view when I put them in a Venn diagram. One of my favorites is about my relationship with my father. You know, he caused me uh, unthinkable harm. Goes on the one side. And on the other side, he actually did care for my well-being, and I miss him. And so what does it mean to hold those two truths about my father simultaneously? The truth of my relationship sits in the middle of that Venn diagram. I am not saying that is true for every person who causes harm uh, in relationship to us. I do want to make sure um, that I um, that I that I touch on a couple of the really important questions that came up earlier with regard to folks who cause have caused us harm, right? Someone had asked a question about um, in the meditation, I can't put my abuser in my heart. So that is really useful information, really, really valuable. So and I'm saying draw that person as close as you can notice. Maybe there's a stopping point right now and there's some really useful information there. Um, if you have some inclination to ultimately want to be able to put the person who has caused you harm in the past, uh, that visual image in your heart, it can be useful to dissociate the humanity of the person from their behavior. So you're putting the abuser, the person who has caused you harm, is a way I prefer to use language because it helps me, again, not leave that person or me stuck in time with those labels, but this person who has caused unthinkable harm um, that the image of them can be in your heart without the abuse coming with them. And that is a very tricky thing to do if there's still a really unhealthy relationship in the dynamic. And so be gentle with yourself as you imagine giving this a try and notice if there is a boundary that is coming up that feels necessary at this time, please honor it even in your meditations, right? Uh, it's okay to take your time and to notice over time. I, I find it really interesting. I think about... Uh, you know, there are a lot of terms that we need to dissociate from forgiveness. And one of them is reconciliation. Uh, we can choose to not carry anger towards someone and still never let them into our immediate circle or life, right? That that person may be choosing to continue to cause harm and um, and we may, may need to keep some distance from that person, maybe sometimes permanently in this lifetime. Um, but that doesn't mean that I personally have to carry rage towards that person, right? And so that's, again, the dance that we learn to do. Um, so another question that had come up in the chat that I found really important was around, what if the honest answer to the question, do you feel you have been angry long enough, is no. 
<laughs> like, thank you for that question. That is a beautiful question. And it is so important to honor the answer. So I feel like I'm, I'm writing a book uh, right now called Angry Long Enough Towards Healing and Repair for Ourselves and the World is what I imagine the title to be. And, um, and it, it, there's a, a really, there's like a series of steps uh, that happen in this book. And the first one really was this asking for help and sitting in the presence of a person happened to be the Dalai Lama, but it's not the first person. There are many other wonderful people who have held space for me as I have inventoried uh, my righteous rage uh, and my rightful rage uh, about the many things that I have suffered. And so really, um, you know, do you feel you have been angry long enough? If the answer is no, you do the cost benefit analysis and you find the answer is no. The answer is to then go back and continue to have others and yourself hold with as much compassion, ideally infinite compassion, the answer to that question and the reasons for the answer to that question. So that is what I would say. Go back, go back to that step. It's not a bad step. It's not a you didn't win the forgiveness game. Um, that's not what we're doing here, right? Um, so, so that is one piece. And then someone else asked the question about accountability. Another thing that we really need to dissociate from forgiveness. Forgiveness for me is an intra-individual relinquishment of anger. It's my choice to let go of my anger, or it is my efforts or my practice to let go of my anger that is utterly unrelated to accountability, which to my mind, um, I work in the field of restorative justice, and in restorative justice, we define accountability very differently than the criminal legal system. Uh, the criminal law is a very punitive law. It talks about punishment, and it is driven by retribution. And so that uh, doesn't fit, to my mind, with uh, the mind of forgiveness. To me, restorative justice offers a better alternative, which is to hold the humanity of the person who has caused harm and give them opportunities to repair that harm. And that accountability is about putting things right and being certain that you'll never do it again. And that responsibility of society is to wrap around people who've caused harm to help them become their best selves, uh, not to put them in a cage or to punish them. Um, and so that, you know, that's that's the work that I do. Um, it's like my other thing other than forgiveness. And um, and to me, that that's what I think we need to be moving towards as a society. Uh, accountability is absolutely critical. And it's really one of the most powerful things that can happen that help us move towards forgiveness. Uh, when someone, you know, isn't a prerequisite, because in like in my case, my father will never be able to be accountable for what he's done. But um, but I when I I have had the opportunity to facilitate dialogues between people who've caused harm and the people they've hurt and their ability to take responsibility and their willingness to try to make things as right as possible um, is a is. It, you know, I can't imagine a better cauldron for cooking up some forgiveness than a proper accountability process. So, um, so with that, um, I'm going to say a couple more things and then see if I can grab some of these. I see the I see the chat flying by, and I'm going to try to grab some of these questions. Um, one of the things that I really love is this, um, you know, uh, uh, this story that my cousin once told me. He once asked me uh, when I was ruminating about something he'd heard me ruminate about for some time. He said, Sujata, do you know how to, how to, do you know how to capture a monkey? And I said, no, I have no idea. How does one capture a monkey? Where, where is this going? And he said, you know, you just take a, you go, you find a tender coconut as it's growing on the vine and you put a pot around it and you let that coconut grow until it fills the whole pot and then you cut it off the vine. And then you leave that coconut filled pot somewhere where monkeys frequent and a monkey will come by and it will put its hand inside that pot and try to pull that coconut out and it will not let go under any circumstances it really wants that coconut so um so you know when you go to capture the monkey the monkey will give up its freedom instead of giving up that coconut right so uh so he says are you ready to let the coconut go you know, and I think that that's a really wonderful, another way of thinking about, uh, have I been angry long enough? How is this disserving me? Am I, am I that monkey sitting there, um, holding onto that coconut in that pot being captured? 
by my own rage. So, um, so yes, if you have decided that you have been angry long enough, uh, there are a few things you can do. Uh, the first is to learn to meditate, learn to reign in that mind. The mind is simply out of my own control when I am enraged. And when I uh, take the time to starting with a breath, learning how to rein the mind in and then doing other types of practices that help me reduce on the cushion meditation. There are so many. Uh, a lot of things that are compassion related really help. So every meditation I've learned through the Compassion Institute have been really, really beneficial on this front. Uh, other forms of meditation, the Just Like Me meditation that Thupten Jimpa teaches, um, again, from the Compassion Institute, really powerful. And the other piece uh, is really about learning to open our hearts in the littlest ways that we can to folks we consider our enemies, not excusing their behavior, as His Holiness explained, but considering their humanity, their position, and their needs. Uh, the more we are allowed, to allow ourselves to see people as humans, uh, the better the better it gets. And so um, in my own experience, it was metta bhavana practice, a loving kindness meditation that I was practicing at the end of a 10-day vipassana retreat. Um, the first one that I sat, uh, it was that first nine days of reigning in the mind with the breath observation and then the body scanning. And then by the time they taught us metta bhavana, I had an image of my father arise in my metta bhavana practice. And this time I just allowed um, that loving kindness to flow out of me and into his image, and he dissolved into light. And so that is a piece of how I, you know, work with this meditation that I shared uh, with you earlier. I hesitate to say it in some t in some ways because I don't want people to set that as a bar for themselves. Like, oh, I'm gonna go sit a ten day vipassana course, and when they teach uh, loving kindness, I'm gonna forgive the worst things that ever happened to me. Um, you know, we're we're all operating at our own pace, and there were a lot of other causes and conditions that gave rise to my ability for that for that to occur, almost as if. Uh, I hesitate to use the word grace because it implies that it came from somewhere outside a very specific set of causes and conditions. And the first being that there are many people who have listened to my whole story and helped me inventory the impact of this on my life. Um, and again, that shift wasn't a resignation to injustice. I have spent the rest of my life working to end intimate partner and sexual violence. Uh, but, you know, it's it was really about making peace with a past I cannot change. Uh, and it's a definition I've heard from Oprah, which I really love. Forgiveness is giving up hope that the past could have been any different. Uh, it doesn't mean that the past was okay, but the past is the past. Uh, and that we can give up hope that the past would have been every, any different and try to create a different and more beautiful future for ourselves. So um, with that, I will spend a little bit of time um, in the chat checking out these beautiful, beautiful questions. There's so many. Um, see if I can grab one. Oh, this is interesting. Restorative justice is great, but do we but do we need to follow up to see if it helps in the longer run? Well, there's actually quite a bit of data about this. Um, we've done quite a few studies showing that restorative justice does actually reduce uh, reoffense by 44% for felony offenses, and that there's a 91% victim satisfaction rate. So I find that quite interesting. It's a little bit off the topic, but I it just it was a short question, so I could grab it there. Um, of the coconut story. Uh, yeah, my sense is the majority of people in prison have experienced childhood trauma. Yeah, it leads to some form of mental illness, well, at least trauma. And, and, you know, we say hurt people hurt people, but healed people can heal people. And so I think that's important. Um, trying really hard to find a question here. I'm seeing lots of beautiful comments. What was that brilliant first sentence from Oprah? Oprah. Oh, yeah. Um, let me pull up the exact quote. You can actually Google it, the Oprah forgiveness episode. You can watch the whole thing. It's phenomenal. Um, I think I'd have it memorized for all the times I'd said it. Going back to my notes here. Forgiveness is giving up hope that the past could have been any different. Um, when I, there was another question earlier that I found uh, in the chat about 
this uh, a mental state that really looks for black and white. Um, oh, and I kind of answer that with the uh, the two truths, learning how to draw event diagrams, feeling like we judge ourselves for having these like very black and white views or a mental state that wants to find the right answer. I would really encourage uh, for that person who asked that question to play with event diagrams and see what happens. Mm. I'm really appreciating all of these um, beautiful comments, and um, some of them are quite personal, so I won't I won't read them out loud. But they're really wonderful comments, and just I feel very much in awe and honored that people have chosen to dig into this thorny topic. Um, yeah. Just a lot of comments about the hand and the coconut. Mm. Here's a tough question, and it's about it's about restorative justice, but it's also about forgiveness. What if the person is a serial perpetrator and says they will continue, uh, uh, says they will continue, or doesn't say it, but they undoubtedly will? Again, it's really really important. Um, sometimes I feel like you know my forgiveness of of my father came a bit e more easily to me because. He isn't here anymore. And when people are continuing to cause harm, that is always the heavier lift. So there's two pieces. One is, do we choose to so forgive? I feel that it's really important to dissociate restorative justice from forgiveness. A restorative justice process, when properly done, involves bringing people ideally face-to-face -face with their family and community to have a conversation in which the person who's caused harm is held directly accountable to the self-identified needs of the person who experienced the harm and that they are supported and they are required by their family and community to complete a plan to repair that harm, right? And so it requires a level of willingness to engage, right? That's really huge. So that's the starting point. Um, and, um, and so that's really different than a forgiveness process, which is again, an intra-individual ch choice or um, sometimes not a choice. Sometimes you just wake up and you realize oh, I'm not angry anymore, right? It's my own personal letting go of my anger, my rage, um, my hatred, my right to retribution and revenge, uh, these kinds of things I've released towards people who have caused me harm. And, and sometimes I've done this with people who continue to cause me harm. Like I'm not angry anymore about things that will never be resolved and will recur. Uh, and, and I can say that I love these people and care for them deeply and, and keep a boundary. I know where to put them. <laughs> I know how to, I, I, there's a, a lovely expression, don't go to the butcher for bread. And so this is not meant in any way to be disparaging of the butcher. Although as a vegetarian, I should probably find a different analogy. I think I said, don't go uh, to the hardware store for milk, right? Like know what the thing is, know who we're engaging in, Keep our minds open to the possibility of every person's transfer transformation. And at the same time, right, like mm, this person has done the same thing over and over and continues to do the same thing over and over. So I know what I'm getting in relationship to this in relationship to this relationship. So let me be wise about that, right? Let me keep my heart open to the possibility of their change while being wise about uh, how how close to bring this person. Um, what am I equipped to do? Uh, how am I equipped to be with this person? I am trying to be my own best self. And uh, if there's certain circumstances that continually cause some of my worst elements to arise, then maybe I'm not ready for that cauldron. Uh, so that is, that's something that I, I think about a bit. Um, so, so yeah, but I can choose to not be angry. That's always just for me. And the work uh, really is about sitting on that cushion um, or getting a try out in the world and just softening, softening, softening that image. One of the things is, yeah, drawing this person into your heart or just keeping them out there, but seeing, can I even just try to wish them well? Can I say, um, can I say, I, I wish for you well-being? Um, uh -huh. So here's one. Um, I'm still having trouble separating accountability from forgiveness. How do you feel okay about the lack of accountability? Is that a byproduct of forgiveness? 
I don't think I ever feel okay about a lack of accountability. I wish that every person who caused harm in the world, including myself, had an opportunity to be accountable. I wish that for every scenario in which there is harm. Um, but I don't need to be angry about that. Right? I can I can want an outcome without anger being affiliated with it. So for me, forgiveness is the absence of anger. The absence of anger, hatred, the right to retribution and revenge in my heart. But I'm still working to make sure that there was a world in which accountability happens. I'm a recovering lawyer <laughs> and I am trained as someone who thinks about justice all the time, um, somebody who's deeply engaged in social justice stuff. So I want to see uh, I want to see accountability for all the past harms. I want to see uh, truth commissions for for all the things. Um, and um, and none of that has to come from a place of anger in my own heart. It can come from a quite practical and healing place. I hope that's helpful to that question. So there's some questions about like how do we how do we forgive these really ongoing um ongoing and really brutal atrocities that happen in our lives. <clears throat> and again the advice is to be gentle. Gentle, gentle with ourselves. Try to open slowly, slowly, and think about it as a practice for yourself. You know, um, if you find that the anger is debilitating for you, are there ways in which uh, loosening the anger in and of itself? Um, there are other visualizations you can do that don't involve the person. You can personify the rage in your heart, like as some sort of like black, um, burning, red hot coal that sits there in your chest. And see if you can let some something help cool it down. Like these kinds of things, the visualizations, the body-based visualizations that work for you, you can make them up. <laughs> I make them up. I, I lead meditation on Monday nights at my temple, and I'm often making things up based on what works for my body. Anger lives in the body. The body keeps the score, as Bessel van der Kolk says. It's so true. Um, and so body-based visualizations that help us actually feel the loosening of the grip can be really useful. You don't have to work with, um, with, with the actual person if that feels too hard. Um, mm. Oh, there's a very sweet question about how to deal with a person who insists on a pseudo relationship but refuses to commit. This is a sad answer, but I think I would go back to don't go to the butcher for bread. Yeah, um, you know, we hope for change. And if we hope for too long, then life passes us by. You know, there are uh, jobs I have left and relationships I have left, um, all of these things, because I know that the pace at which change is likely to occur does not meet my needs. And then I will just be angry and I don't need that. And the other person doesn't need to feel bad about themselves that they're unable to meet my needs or that organization doesn't need to feel like it wasn't, you know, good enough to keep me or whatever. Like we just you know, we, we are allowed to part ways and wish people well, understanding that they are where, they're, where they are right now. Thank you for that beautiful question. I think we are coming up on time shortly. Um, oh, I was able to forgive my father while he was still alive. This was the best thing I'd ever done for myself. I was able to see the good side of him. Um, he'd stopped drinking and I saw the sensitive side of him. It was nice to see and freeing for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> wishing them well, get well soon. That's funny. Sometimes, you know, it is like that, wishing that they get well. Um, yeah. Some beautiful comments. We forgive to, for ourselves, to free ourselves. It doesn't mean we condone the actions, the harms of others. So true. Mm. You know, and I just want to, I know I just said we're going to close, but just a couple more one of the comments is about um, a corporation that is causing harm. These are particularly difficult. Um, I know lots of people who 
are doing good work in the world to try to save us from environmental catastrophe or governments you know trying to save entire oppressed cultures um, from from governments who occupy them um you know it's just these these are really hard things and I think about Tibet I think about um, fires caused by corporations um, that destroy our environment destroy people's homes so, how do we deal with rage against the machine is a really, really important thing. Uh, there are a few things that I do on that front. I do what I can. I work a lot with the serenity prayer, a secularized version of it. Uh, may I have the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And when I am feeling drowning in the atrocities that are perpetrated by machines that feel so much larger than my capacity to change. Uh, I spend a little time with that as a meditative practice and meditate on developing serenity about what feels beyond me, courage, and a little step actually that I could lean into about, mm, but maybe there is a letter I could write or a phone call I could make, and that really helps. A thing I can donate to, something. Um, and then on the... Um, the wisdom to know the difference. Sometimes I bite off more than me and my family and my coworkers, et cetera, can chew. And then I have to be honest with myself about, about um, having, having lacked the wisdom uh, to know the difference. And so I spend uh, some time really trying to work with just the courage to change the things I can piece um, and breathing into the things that are uh, not mine at this moment and feeling deep gratitude for those who are right? Cheering for the people who are. For me, the environment is a very heavy one. I, when I think about, you know, mass extinctions of frogs or whatever, like I can have worked on death penalty cases. I can work in domestic violence. I can work with mass criminalization. All of that I can handle. But when I think about, you know, mass extinctions of species of frogs, I find myself completely overwhelmed. And so when I do, I just spend a little time looking up people who do beautiful work in that field and sometimes I send random people a love letter. <laughs> Thank you for doing this gorgeous thing, you know, um, and especially people who have really embattled and difficult jobs. I wrote one just today. I wrote an email to somebody uh, who is dealing with a very, very difficult thing in a school district, and they don't know me. They don't know who I am, but I just wrote them a little note and said, hey, thanks for your courage on this difficult issue. I'm grateful that you are uh, doing the right thing. And uh even that can just really make you feel good. Find a person who's doing a thing about a thing you feel hopeless about and write them a love letter. It, you have no idea how much juice that might give them to just keep going. So with that, I see there are 23 new messages. I wish there were time to read them all aloud, but I feel very grateful. Um, and I... Um, and I'm very grateful for this time with you all today. Thank you so much for this beautiful session. Let's close it out with a little, there's time for folks to go into um, um, discussion groups if you would like, uh, but what I just wanna close out with is um, a breath, let's do a breath. There was a lot, a lot of really powerful, beautiful work folks were doing tonight. And in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, we always start with our motivation and we close with rejoicing and dedication. And so I would really ask us to rejoice, rejoice in all the things you shared tonight, all the hard work you did, all the honesty about the hard parts, honoring where you are. Thank you so much for all of that. Really let your heart rejoice. I'm so glad I applied myself in this positive way. And then let that get exponential. Wow, let's rejoice in all the good work that everyone did tonight. All the hard work. All the honesty. Just like let that exponentially grow. How wonderful. How wonderful that we did this. And let's close out with this uh, dedication that I hope you'll all join me in. From the bottom of our hearts, let's wish, may we all be happy.
May we all be free from suffering. May we free ourselves from actions that cause harm to ourselves and others. May we be free of the causes of anger, both external and internal. And may any beneficial transformations that arose during our time together tonight continue to help me be a kinder and more positive person for myself and others. May our collective practice be of benefit to all beings everywhere. <laughs>